What is happening, everybody? James Hancock here. We've got a new Ghostbusters movie about to come out, and I thought it'd be fun to do a flashback review of the 1984 classic, a movie that I saw in the theater at age seven in a row full of kids, and one that I still love dearly to the present day. And for those of you who've been following this channel for a while, you'll know that I've got a special affection for the locations in this movie. We tackled it in a short film I produced two years ago called The Movies That Define New York Part 1. And here I am at Ghostbusters headquarters with my good friend, Bill Scurry. I have not yet seen Ghostbusters Afterlife. My understanding is that a lot of people lost their minds watching it at New York Comic Con, and I'll definitely be there on opening day. But here's the reason I really wanted to do this video. It seems like some people out there are excited not about what Afterlife is, but rather what it is not, namely the 2016 train wreck. Don't get me wrong, if the new movie connects with an audience, more power to them. But with so many conversations about Ghostbusters over the last five years, what almost always gets left out of the conversation is an appreciation for the really specific tone and style of humor that made the first one work so well. Judging just from the trailer, the flavor of this new movie feels much more innocent, nostalgic, almost like an homage to movies like E.T. or Goonies. Now, I saw those flicks a billion times as a kid, but they were quite different from Ghostbusters. What made Ghostbusters unique was how on the surface it had all these ingredients that could be enjoyed by kids, but the movie also featured one scene after another with really adult humor, jokes that flew completely over my head at the time, which I suspect made adults in the audience laugh all the harder because they knew the kids in the audience were totally clueless. And I just rewatched the movie and I was kind of blown away by just how many scenes there are, either about people discussing getting laid or outright trying to get laid. All while this fantasy adventure featuring ghosts and proton packs is unfolding before our eyes, my suspicion is that this new movie is going to go all in with an adventure full of childlike wonder and awe, but with none of the edge that made that first movie so cool. I'll find out in a few weeks. In any case, I think part of what really makes that first movie feel so special is how in so many ways it is a true love song to New York, specifically Manhattan, the culture, the personalities, the ordinary people who are just trying to turn a buck or maybe enjoy the occasional bonk along the way. Along with Marvel Comics, the 1984 Ghostbusters was my introduction to New York City, a place where I've lived for the last 13 years. And as someone who's now a resident, I enjoy this movie now more than ever. And of course, it helps when you have a genius like Laszlo Kovacs as your director of photography, but would really seal the deal with this movie was having so many brilliant collaborators who'd been working together to make people laugh for many years, coming together for what would end up being a career high. Whether you're talking about their work on Second City or SNL or movies like Meatballs and Stripes, Bill Murray, Harold Ramis, Dan Aykroyd, Rick Moranis, and director Ivan Reitman, they already had this incredible shorthand they were used to working together, they trusted one another, and they all just had comedy in their bones. And while Dan Aykroyd might have had a sentimental love and affection for old comedy horror movies like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, Ghostbusters was not a nostalgic movie. It was modern. It was brand new. And basically, Dan Aykroyd was just a total maniac on the subject of quantum physics and parapsychology and thought it'd be cool to marry these two topics together into a screenplay, which is why their gear is so damn cool. We've never seen anything like that before. And that kind of originality is why people are still ripping off and or paying homage to all these concepts so many decades later. My attitude these days towards a lot of these old franchises is that Hollywood should just leave them alone. Almost always, with very few exceptions, they just fuck them up in a wide variety of ways. What I always push for is the need for new original franchises that are made in the spirit of all these old classics. When I think back to all the new franchises that were launched in the 80s, I mean, we had Indiana Jones, Robocop, Terminator, Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, Nightmare on Elm Street, Predator, Friday the 13th, Rambo, Evil Dead, Lethal Weapon. It's just ridiculous. The list just goes on and on. Because I feel like once a franchise starts to feel more like a brand than a story, you're in trouble. Now you're just managing intellectual property like a stock in a portfolio, and that is the death of anything creative ever being done with that property again. But let's dig a little deeper and try and unpack why this first movie is still so adored all these years later. First and foremost, the story manages to feel tight and economical and incredibly loose and improvisational all at once. The original movie is only one hour and 45 minutes long, but they pack so much story and lore into it, and yet, the movie feels so free, almost like Bill Murray can do whatever he wants and they'll just let the cameras keep rolling. That only works when you have a comedic actor as brilliant as Bill Murray, and more importantly, when you have so many great performers who wrote the thing 
already there on the set. You're not sending notes to some bitter bastard miles away hammering away on his keyboard and hoping it gets back to you that day. You're getting your scenes right then and there and moving on. Another thing to keep in mind is how this movie starts really small, grounded, almost mundane. At the opening, we get this brief tease of a ghost before we dive right into a scene where, surprise, surprise, Venkman is trying to get it on with a student all while delivering electric shocks to some poor schmuck who signed up for an experiment for five whole dollars. You only have 75 more to go, okay? What's this one? And this is the tone for the rest of the movie. A little pseudoscience, a few laughs, and a lot of sex appeal. It's a magic mixture that works again and again, right up until the end of the movie, even when the sexual innuendo is gross. Are you, Alice, menstruating right now? What has that got to do with it? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. But then just before the 30 minute mark, this movie starts to crescendo and get more intense. The legendary Annie Potts gets a call which prompts her classic response, and suddenly we're in a giant effects laden hit movie. And what's cool is though the Ghostbusters are basically still blue collar guys. They're depicted more like overworked firefighters or exterminators, guys with bad diets who smoke too much, but with proton packs. And then the movie just keeps building and building until we're seeing an epic battle for the survival of New York. And what I love is how none of these ingredients seem to contradict or cancel each other out. When the flick needs to be spooky, it is. When it needs spectacle, it's there, big time. When it needs to be sexy, holy shit it is. And when it needs to make you crack up, home run. That is just so rare. Most movies barely manage to pull off even getting one of these ingredients right. What really helps bring it all together is that the characters in this movie, they never stop being New Yorkers. When Rick Moranis is attacked right outside a restaurant, the people just go right back to their meals. When an old lady sees a demon dog in the hall, she just shuts the door. Hold up! And no matter what crazy shit is going on around them, the characters are always talking about whether or not they're getting paid for overtime or going out of business. Ghostbusters, what do you want? Like with any of the crazy shit that happens in the city, New Yorkers just roll with it and get on with their lives. But watching it now as a cynical, mean old bastard, what still gets me howling with joy is the flick's sex appeal. Namely, the great Sigourney Weaver. Age seven, I didn't really appreciate what she brought to the table, but now, holy cow, her performance is incredible. And I love how she just goes for it when Venkman comes by her apartment only to encounter the gatekeeper. Let's put aside the obvious double entendres of gatekeeper and keymaster for a moment, but this scene is just a blast to watch because you have Sigourney Weaver in full-blown seductress mode saying shit like, do you want this body or I want you inside me. Take me now, sub-creature. Either Ghostbusters isn't a kid's movie like a lot of people think, or it's the best goddamn kid's movie ever made. Keep in mind, this flick was rated PG. They quite literally do not make them like they used to. And then the scene ends with Bill Murray saying goodbye like they just had the best sex of their lives. And of course, at age seven, this whole scene just flew 10 feet right over my head. And I don't want to belabor the obvious by bringing this up again and again, but the sex jokes just never stop. Whether you're talking about Ray dreaming about getting a head from a ghost, or Rick Moranis gazing into a girl's tits as they dance, or best of all, Rick Moranis and Sigourney Weaver sitting up after what has obviously been the best damn demonic sex imaginable in order to allow Gozer to enter our world, these scenes are what give Ghostbusters a little bit of an edge. It's not an awe-inspiring children's adventure movie, it's secretly an 80s sex comedy, and I fucking love it. So as a way of starting to bring things to a close, I just want to give a few quick shout-outs to some of the other ingredients, like the jaw-dropping special effects, which have so much style and personality, little simple things like wind blowing through the hair of the characters in the presence of ghosts, or the tactile ectoplasmic residue all over the movie, or just the signature look of a stream as it convulses out of a proton pack. I love it all. And the lore. I love the many references to Tobin's spirit guide, the look of the other dimension within Dana's fridge, or just all the crazy batshit lore that Rick Moranis spouts out when he's brought to Egon by the cops. During the rectification of the Voldroni, the Traveler came as a large and moving torb. Then, during the third reconciliation of the last of the McKetrick supplicants, they chose a new forum for him. That of a giant slore. And of course we have the great Ernie Hudson as Winston who's just trying to make ends meet and needs a steady nine to five. Since I joined these men, I have seen shit that'll turn you white. And I haven't mentioned Elmer Bernstein's brilliant score, which often gets overlooked due to the pop music soundtrack. As you can tell, I basically love everything about this movie, right down to the iconic location at 55 Central Park West. But I think I've shouted enough praise on this classic for now. I'm constantly seeing obnoxious hot takes online about how the original film is overrated. Suffice to say, I disagree. As I've said before, a few laughs, a little sex, and a little action go a long way, especially when you have a kick-ass new idea for a movie. 
one that is still being exploited nearly 40 years later. So no, the original's not overrated. It was a fucking gold mine. At any rate, I'll be off to check out the new movie in a few weeks, but my excitement is a few notches below what I've been seeing from some other commentators. I'm just too damn old to get excited about watching a kid's movie, unless that movie's gonna go all the way in on the way kids really talk like we saw in movies like Stand By Me or the original Bad News Bears. Otherwise, give me Peter goddamn Venkman as the central character. But I'll hold off on saying anything else until I've seen the new movie. I hope you've enjoyed this little rant about Ghostbusters. If so, remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell, etc. But I can't thank you enough for watching this video. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.